This is not my first rodeo at piano fight. I performed here back in 2016 as part of the Pint Size Play Festival. But I was a nervous wreck. Picture me in the green room getting ready for the show. I haven't acted since junior high. I mean, I've done a million comedic and music performances, but this is the theater. More raw, more stripped down, more me against the unflattering overhead light. <laughs> the stage manager calls 15 minutes to places, and I tell Jake Arkey, the play's director, <laughs> that I've suddenly broken out in a case of, why don't you go on stage in this nerdy Jewish prayer shawl? <laughs> Jake responds empathetically with, break a leg, you're gonna do Great. <sighs> I wish I could break a leg and never go on stage again. This is the feeling I get before I perform, and it never gets better. I mean, what's the point? I'm a complete imposter, and everybody is going to know it. <sighs> oh, my God. I'm still not done with therapy. <laughs> the stage manager calls Five minutes to places. I'm still busy replaying the practice video of my rehearsal, and oh my god, when I smile, my eyebrows are up to my forehead like Spock. Is this my Oscar-worthy acting or my bad Botox job? <laughs> I can hear Spock saying, live long and go easy on the Botox. I'm in a total panic and think back to when I first wanted to be famous, junior high. Picture Ann Arbor, Michigan, 1980. Ronald Reagan became president and preppy blonde girls ruled the school. Each morning they sashayed through pristine snow in puffy jackets, less sports sock bags, and moon boots. I trudged behind them in last year's fashion trends, getting pelted by their leftover snow, which was now a dirty gray slush. To me, the Waspy girls were the quintessential American cool. To be accepted into their club would be the ultimate pass. I decided to ask this Supercuts hair professional to make me look like Kate Jackson from Charlie's Angels. Literally, the one with the thinnest, most Anglo-Saxon hair. <laughs> but my hair was coarse, and it didn't feather, it frizzed. I came out looking like Gilda Radner, an OG from Saturday Night Live's golden era. <laughs> it became clear that the game was rigged against me, and I would have to enter the cool kids club the hard way. If I wanted to reach the highest status of American culture, I'd become a famous celebrity slash actress slash pop star. I'd make movies, hit records, and perform on my favorite TV show, Dance Fever with Danny Terrio, <laughs> a 1980s TV show where people danced live on a stage pretty mediocrely for half an hour. Think of it as a long-form TikTok. <laughs> but first I had to get through gym class. I was one of the last girls in my grade to wear a bra because, well, I mean, look at me. <laughs> Just don't laugh too hard. It's over there, <laughs> over, over there. Aww. I was determined, at least, not to be the very last girl without a bra. So in the locker room before PE, I announced to all the girls that I finally got a bra. They demanded proof. I removed my top to expose a paper bra that I taped together just to make them laugh. 
I was a clown, and this was my way of making fun of myself before anyone else could. Though I got a pass for being funny, it didn't last long. My nose had a bump like my dad's, whereas everyone else, including my mom, had ski slopes for noses. Check out the differences between these babies. I could have won the nose lottery, but instead, the Y chromosome got me. In social studies class, I caught students passing around a note with a drawing of my nose, and I was mortified. I convinced my mom to let me get a nose job, explaining that it would make me popular, not depressed, and eventually, my job title was gonna be international mega superstar, so I might as well get the nose job out of the way now. <laughs> eventually, mom did let me get my nose job, but nobody even noticed I was any different. They didn't even make fun of me, they just ignored me. I was at my wit's end when my dream opportunity finally presented itself a chance to star in the end of year school play. I was considered one of the best actors in the class, but I was not one of the teacher's pets. This teacher, Mrs. Smith, was always making students suck up to her to get roles. The popular kids who didn't even act became her best friends and got all the good parts. I refused to ingratiate myself to her. I had too much of an authority issue mixed with a healthy Jewish irreverence and skepticism. <laughs> Even if I was awkward looking myself, my judgmental teenage brain rejected a wannabe who dressed 20 years younger than she looked with cheap designer jeans knockoffs and a comb in one pocket that didn't hide her visible panty lines. <laughs> I was pleasantly surprised to find out that I got the leading role in the play, but unpleasantly surprised to discover that a popular girl who had never acted before in her life was going to share the role with me. <sighs> so totally lame. I was devastated. I didn't pursue theater again until college where I wrote and directed short films and also a multimedia play. And I was in a musical theater production of Jesus Christ Superstar alongside Lucy Liu. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, she's the one that did a remake of Charlie's Angels, which is like total callback to previous. Lucy played an apostle. I was in the chorus and I played a prostitute. <laughs> I finally felt like an insider, but ironically, it was performing in a show about the world's most famous Jew. I had to admit, that like Jesus, I was too anti-establishment to want fame and celebrity on someone else's terms. I wanted to write my own material. I wanted to put the Jew back in Jesus Christ, superstar. I know these references are before your time, but <laughs> I'll post all the links online. You can check them out. Fast forward to 2016. I'm a filmmaker and adjunct film professor at about five colleges, and I perform my own music. <laughs> MadelineMinks.com. When Jake asks me to star in his pint-sized festival play, I'm totally honored but really, really nervous. When the lights come up, I'm seated at a piano fight table in that front area, pretending to be just another bar goer. I pound my IPA and launch straight into my performance. The audience surrounds me on all sides. 
and I can't help feel their energy like a warm embrace. I'm playing this optimistic woman recalling her bat mitzvah, and I admit a certain pride in my Jewish heritage washes over me. I can't help wonder if at this point in my life I would finally have rocked my original ethnic nose like a champion. <laughs> my confidence is short-lived when I get to the climax of the play and realize it's going to be really hard to emote through the bad Botox. But hey, if I lean into my deadpan sensibility, I won't have to smile. <laughs> yeah. No smile equals laughs. <laughs> this girl is eating it up, so I just keep going. <laughs> Despite feeling like an awkward Vulcan on the inside, no one seems to notice. They're all cheering and rooting me on. I can hear the friendly laughter <laughs> and the supportive applause. <laughs> I'm suddenly confident and comfortable in my own skin. At Piano Fight, everyone is a bit of a weirdo, nerd, multi-hyphenate, or a misfit. People like me who didn't get invited to the sleepovers with the popular kids. Or their hair didn't feather like Kate Jackson's. It feels amazing to be accepted, and it's what makes Piano Fight special. I wish I would have had a place like Piano Fight growing up, but I got to experience it as an adult, and I want others to know that they're welcomed no matter what. So when I teach filmmaking and performance, I want to nurture all the students' voices, not have them suck up to me to feed my ego the way Mrs. Smith did. Though a little sucking up is okay. <laughs> Everyone has talent and a story to tell. Not all of us are cool. Some of us are late bloomers. Some of us wear paper bras. <laughs> so let's raise our glass and toast to piano fight. Here's to teaching us about love and giving us a place to belong. May we all live long and go easy on the Botox. Give it up for Noemi Ziegler!